broadcasting from Studio City, California. This is one of the most anticipated episodes of The Knapsack Files, especially for me personally. I'm Ken Knapsack. Welcome to The Knapsack Files, the show that's about life, the universe, and everything. Douglas Adams would agree it's about the climb for fame. It's about the fail, failed climb for fame. It's about life. It's about the universe. It's about everything. And with me is... Mr. Mark Ellis. Thank you. I don't know who Douglas Adams is. You don't know? Du- okay, well, <laughs> no. we'll start. The, we'll shut down the interview now. Doug Adams. Doug, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Ah, okay, very my good. Favorite, uh, one of my favorite authors. That was always one of those ones I saw on the video shelf when I was a kid at Video Update, oh, and yeah. the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It was like a double uh, VHS. It was like two of them. And so I just remember, that was the BBC series, yeah. Yeah, and I just remember seeing it and being like, "Yeah, I, I just don't think this is the week for that." I'm gonna make the, <laughs> the I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I usually do a video update. I'm gonna make the play for Basic Instinct. If that gets shot down, then I'll have to rent Rover Dangerfield again. Outstanding. Well, mm-hmm. we're off. Well, we're we're now we know about your childhood. We can move on to other things. <laughs> uh, Mark Ellis is a stand-up comedian. He is a um, film critic officially, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and a one half of the Schmoes No Movie Reviews team. And uh, technically, that makes you kind of my boss in that world, in the Schmoes No Podcast world. <laughs> Tread lightly, knapsack. Yeah. Um, no, and I'm very happy to be here. I really am. I've been yeah. wanting to do the show for a while. You so. have, and we've had some misfires on some schedulings. Mm-hmm. We've, I've had to cancel. You've had to cancel. And you can pay me whenever. It, it doesn't have to be tonight. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'll take it out of my uh, uh, contract for the podcast. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm gl- so glad to have you here because you have uh, one of the more busier schedules because you, you, Schmoes No those movies don't watch themselves. No, they don't. You guys watch two or three a day, right? It, we, yeah, we uh, we had two yesterday. It, wow. it could have been three if we really push it. It's to the point now when it's like, okay, do we really want to redline it and get to that third one, squeeze that one in there? Like, there's movies now that are major releases. It just gets really, really tough to see right. movies. Right. And it's funny to say that. It's like, man, I got a long day of, what, what are you, being in the coal mines? No, I got to sit down and do nothing and try to not fall asleep. Which is ironically what Josh the intern tries to do every day himself when he gets that movie pass. <laughs> he has my movie pass he right does? now. Yeah. You pay him well. Yeah, he, somebody's using it, you know? You pay him well. Let's get into the Schmoes No World because um, Christian Harloff, for lack of a better term, is kind of the face of the franchise. Well, by the, what I mean, I've heard his take and his story on it uh, – a lot, and and because he's so uh, happy to share. Hey, here's how we started, because it is a great story of how you two started. Yeah. I haven't really heard the Mark Ellis version of it. Yeah, from your your, your side of uh, of things, how did it start, and and what do you view it as now, and where it's going, and all that fun stuff. He just tells me where to show up, and I do it, <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Accurate. What's the next question? <laughs> accurate, <laughs> accurate description. It, um, I mean, it it really is one of those things that just kind of evolved. It's mm-hmm. it was it was literally teeing up something on the first hole and not knowing what the second hole looks like. You know, right. it, it was playing a course for the first time and not knowing if it ended, if it's going to keep going, where is it going to go from here? Because, I mean, again, initially it was just guys who were getting paid to sit around, drink beer, and talk about movies into a right. flip cam. Right. And then it turns into something else. That's like, it's like an operation. And it's weird. It even freaked me out when you say, like, technically, I am somebody's boss now. I yeah. have I have people working under me. Absolutely. And that's really weird to say because I'm wearing a backwards hat and a RoboCop <laughs> shirt. <laughs> You're at oh, yeah. Detroit Robot City. Is that what it is? Okay. Yeah, it's a ripped apparel uh, classic combining <laughs> Kiss and RoboCop, two of the greatest things to ever come out of Detroit. Absolutely. Not named Barry Sanders. Or uh, Ron LaFleur. Um, but... Um, <laughs> Wow, I just made a w- random weird reference to a center fielder in the 1983 Tiger lineup. See, I That's got great. That. You got it. But wow. the Douglas Adams thing. You didn't. So That's okay. Threw That's me okay. For a loop, yeah. So obviously, when when the Schmoes No thing started, you had no idea where it's going, like you said. Um, but did you have a great passion for movies before this, or was it just something like, yeah, I like movies, I'll watch? Yeah, I, I loved movies, but you know what? I I think I'm a little bit like you in that I loved movies that I loved. You know, I and then there's a whole bunch of movies that I just never seen, and I wasn't a huge theater goer. I think this is probably the beginning of uh, maybe the genesis of my disdain for being in public places, (laughs) unless I'm the guy that is the reason why it's a public place. You know, like I want to be the guy on stage, or I don't want to be in a crowd because I just don't like dealing with people anymore. People ask me, "What can? Why don't you see movies? Why don't you go to stand up shows? Why don't you go to wrestling shows? If I'm not in it, Mm -hmm. I'd rather be home." Yeah, it's, doing other things, and it's weird to recommend a movie now to to mm-hmm. do a show where you're saying, "Yeah, Yo, you guys definitely got to rush out and see this movie." Because in the back of my head, I'm thinking I had a great 
way to see this film. It was it was on a studio lot. Right. It was in a nice room. Everybody's there for the same reason. There's no crying babies. There's nobody <laughs> talking on cell phones. It's a serene environment. So if I send somebody, if I'm like, no, you got to see this movie, it's got to be a really good movie. Because right. I, I still occasionally when I'm on the road or something, I'll go see a movie and it, you just forget how, you know, people mm-hmm. can turn into wild animals yeah. when the lights go down. They do. And, and I think you and I are the same type. Uh, outside, if you didn't have studio screenings and all that stuff, you'd probably still be like me, which is I only see a movie if I know I can see it Wednesday at 10 a.m. Absolutely, yeah. That's that's the way to see a movie, unless it's something like a an Avengers or a Batman, where it's it's mm-hmm. midnight and let's go see this with the true fans. Yeah, because they're all going to shut up too. They, they'll cheer, yeah. but they'll. You know what's funny though is that wait, my favorite superhero movie of all time may be Batman Begins. And that yeah. movie was released before we started doing schmoes, a couple years before. Mm-hmm. I was living in L.A. already, but I didn't go see that movie in the theater. And I'm like, I'm a huge I didn't either. Batman fan. And I remember it coming out and being like, hey, it's cool, Batman's mm-hmm. back. And he's not played by George Clooney with bat nipples. That's exciting. <laughs> and I never saw the movie until yeah. Netflix shipped it to me. Uh, I am um, have become a huge Lord of the Rings fan movie version. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, didn't read the books, which is weird because I'm a giant book reader. But uh, didn't yeah, see. Fellowship. We get it. You're smarter than me. That's true. Um, <laughs> you want to read my comic books with me? A lot of them have pictures. You're listening at home. He's shaking books at me as he's saying this. <laughs> Throw at him. Um, uh, I didn't see the f- Fellowship in the theater. That's a lot of effort. Yeah, I don't want to go there. Especially for Lord of the Rings, man. Yeah. Those, those ain't short movies. Those are no. that's a, that's a two pee breaker. Yeah. kind of movie Absolutely. when you're into it. Yeah, you know. But but then by the same token, I mean I do love movies. The ones that I love, like I am a passionate, passionate Star Wars fans, as yeah. a few of you may know. Yeah, as we've heard. Yeah, it's it's not just a fun movie for me to watch. It's not just my favorite you know story to tell with these characters mm-hmm. that I love. It's it's defined my life literally. Right. It has been a driving force. In whatever Mark Ellis has become, absolutely, and, and now, now in fact, that you have force, driving force, force and look, look at that. pun you have made. Um, <laughs> are you? You're not an antisocial person, though, are you? Uh, I it, it's. I think I've become that. You know, okay. it's it, it's a really weird. Kenny, what I'm going through right now? Oh my god! You know, I started out life, and and I was pretty sure I was an optimist for a long time. And then, right, yeah. and then I just decided, well, maybe I'm an optimist, but I don't subscribe to a lot of that party's ideology, <laughs> you know, like, like, <laughs> and then I'm like, maybe I'm yeah. just a pessimist. Maybe all that magic from Super Bowl 22 and the epic Doug Williams second quarter has run out. 35 points, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe um, it's done. And as far as being antisocial, I, when it's time to talk to people, yeah. I love doing it and I yeah. enjoy it. But what's what coming from stand up, what that does is. The, the average person maybe interacts with, I don't know, maybe they interact with 200 people a day, maybe it's 100 sure. people. And with stand up, you get to condense all that into one little conversation that you control. Right. So when you're done doing that, it's, I'm going to go back to my room and right. get some beer and listen to the Knapsack files. You know, I don't want to talk. Which, which I know that's not a 100% lie because I'll get 1 a.m. 1 a.m. text from you. <laughs> Uh, either about the schmoes, hey man, you killed it on the news tonight, and I appreciate. Uh, you know, even if I'm asleep, I'll wake up and r- answer back to you because yeah. I know you're lonely in some hotel room in Jacksonville, having just you know slayed a crowd. Yeah, and now you're home. It's alone. funny because Chris, when I get back from the road, Christian will ask me. He's like, "Hey, how was how are the shows? You know, what what was the best show? You meet anybody?" And then you'll already know because you're like, "Well, let's see. I got a text from Ellis Thursday night <laughs> and a text Friday night. Nothing Saturday, so maybe something happened Saturday. Yeah, maybe maybe he talked to a nice young girl about some Redskins football <laughs> plays or something." Yeah, you know. that, that really is life on the road as a comic. It's like, okay, let's see what the crowd looks like as they're leaving. Mm. Swing and a miss. Mm. Where do I get a free six pack? <laughs> Where do I uh, get a, like a hotel uh, vending machine cracker <laughs> set and a Diet Coke? That's that's a fun game to do recently. Is I take a picture of the uh, the vending machine mm. and I tweet it. And I say, okay, well, what should I eat? <laughs> like, yeah, what, what should dessert be? How many people want me to get peanut M and M's? How many people are looking at that Kit Kat bar and thinking I haven't had one of those in a while? Because there's glamorous. I, in my time in stand up, my road gigs don't even count as road gigs. They were a local, and I never stayed in a hotel. You know, I did travel yeah. two, three hours, and do little mini tours, but mm-hmm. but it wasn't uh, that you're doing the road. Yeah. The road, and uh, it's not as glamorous as as Dane Cook's reality show on HBO <laughs> made it look. Um, you know, I've heard some crazy stories that my friends had. Oh, we 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 snuck into this room and we had a threesome while a nun watched. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, that's more of the truth, right? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, even when you're a young comic, you watch something like what Dane did with Torgasm yeah. or what uh, what Caparulo and those guys did with Vince Vaughn's Wild West Comedy Show. Is it's let's do thirty shows in thirty nights and. We're 
we're on a tour bus and that's where we sleep. Right. And that looks awesome to a young comic just starting out. Like, yeah. Oh man, it's just us, the road and crowd. <laughs> And then you get out there, and it's you just want your own hotel room. You just want your own space to just yeah. do nothing. It sounds weird because you're sleeping longer. Like, I go on the road now to sleep because yeah. I don't sleep when I'm in L.A. that much. Yeah. When I get on the road, I can land. I can go to sleep. I can do the show. I can go back to sleep. And you just kind of recharge your, your physical self. You, you, you like hotel living? I do. You're good in it. I, I reserved this, uh, observed this at Comic Con, um, uh, and I'm not referencing the argument with the New York lady uh, in the lobby. Though we can get into that. Um, that but was fun. but you're good at it. You're good at talking to the folks, talking to the valet, talking to even when there was an issue. And I was like, ah, this guy's this guy's been in a few hotels yeah. in the last five years here. Yeah, I like to. I, I, I kind of feel like uh, like a young George Clooney and up in the air. <laughs> Remember when he's just giving travel tips? I'm yes. like, this is a good line at the airport. This is how you stay at a hotel. This is how you do all that stuff. It's fun learning that. It's just fun having a skill. You it know, it is really a skill because you know you got to Comic Con uh, before Harloff and I, uh-huh. and uh, you, you had that. You showed up. Right, here's what you're going to want to do. You come in here. You can put your car in there. Load up the car, but they'll check it in. They'll give you a ticket. <laughs> We're gonna, bah, 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 you show up with my pa- yeah. press pass. Um, take us back to uh, young Mark Ellis, uh, uh, growing yes. up in what the hills of Virginia. <laughs> Yes. What, what am I saying the, that right? The Ozark Mountains. The Ozark Mountains. Um, no, it, it, it's actually funny. We were talking about the road before mm-hmm. that because I think that now that I look back on it, I think I may have been predispositioned a little bit to mm-hmm. to acclimate well to a life on the road because when I was, I don't know, the first 12, 13 years of my life, my dad was in the Air Force. Uh, and he he was in he went to medical school and the Air Force paid his way through med school and then he had to pay the Air Force back. Right. So he so we moved all around the country. We started. I was born in North Carolina in Winston Salem. Okay. Okay. Um, Take me through because I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that was because my parents had just gotten out of had just graduated from Wake, gotcha. uh, Wake Forest, and uh, my alma mater, no, uh, yeah, Demon yeah, Deacons. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I lived in uh, Winston Salem for all of six weeks. And then he got stationed in Panama City, Florida. Wow. So he moved down to Panama um, City. And then back up to Rockville, Maryland, out to Fairfield, California, back to Columbia, Maryland, and then into Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, Were you you kind of settled? Yeah, we we kind of settled there because he had gotten out of the Air Force by then and uh, could start practicing. So you had been. Uh, I didn't know that. So you, I didn't know you were a military brat, and you yeah. traveled the world there. I thought you grew up in a little uh, township with a, you know, you had one streetlight or something like that. I thought that the, you had seen a little bit of the country before then. Yeah. What age grew, did you settle? Uh, I settled. I think I was in. Uh, I, I guess I was in fourth grade um, when we were done with that. It's about nine. And okay. It, yeah. The weird thing about. I mean, I guess it's a nice thing that they, that they do is that they move. The, the military generally moves their people in the summertime. So that if they have kids, they don't have to you know mm-hmm. do it in the middle of school year. But my birthday is in July. My birthday yeah. is July seventh. There were three times in a row, three moves in a row when we <laughs> moved. They just came, we moved on my birthday. I just picture you in the back of the station wagon, hidden between suitcases, and they're handing you like a cupcake with a candle. Yeah. Happy birthday, Mark! <laughs> we got you travel <laughs> connect four. Congratulations! <laughs> I spy a haystack. But we loved it, man. I mean, it, maybe you look back on it a little bit more fondly than it, it was sure. at the time. But it was it. me. I have an older sister who's two years older and a brother who's two years younger. And, go, and you know, driving across the country back and forth, and even more so because sometimes in between stations, we'd have to stay with my grandmother in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. So we'd all kind of set up base camp in New Jersey for three weeks while my dad would occasionally take one of us out on one of these trips and uh-huh. then come back. And it was a really, like, it was so such a simple way to live. Like, just get to the Air Force Base, you mm-hmm. know, or the hotel, what I do now. <laughs> yeah. And our big night out was going to Denny's. If we if we went to Denny's, man, we were set. Yeah. And where do you think I spend most of my meals now <laughs> when I'm on it's the... It's a connection. I hit Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm like, great town you guys got here. Where's the Denny's? <laughs> That's outstanding, man. Did, yeah. Uh, w- what point, so maybe after you settled, what point um, did you uh, view comedy as a career? Is it performing as a career? Uh, that's um, it, it's a tough thing because I'm the least I'm the least funny of uh, my brothers and sisters. I'm, really, I re- I truly am. And they're they're damn funny then. They are incredible. My mm-hmm. like my my brother's the headliner. He's okay. hysterical. It, it, we you know we used to play a game around the dinner table. It's just who can make dad laugh the most. Mm. And my dad's face would get like really red, and it'd be like watching a thermometer. Like you're just trying to make the mercury rise a to baker. make the steam blow. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and my brother would always be the closer. He could always just really? knock him out. I'm, I'm me with the opener, and then my sister can tell a hilarious story about what happened to her at the, you know, getting her car fixed that day. Wow. And then Robbie comes on and closes, closes the show. it out. So yeah. she's the feature, he's the headliner, and you're just the host, man. Yeah, wow. It might have been some of that middle child thing where you want more attention or mm. you 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 want to you want approval, something like that. I haven't really done the psychoanalysis yet. <laughs> I'm I'm not that you know. Uh, That's what I'm here for. Deep into my right. despair as a comic yet to actually to sink my teeth into something like that. But I mean, I remember the change because I had a really bad temper when mm. I was a kid. So I, you weren't passive aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> you just were aggressive? No, despite some theories that have been floated out there <laughs> recently. Which I want to point out was Makuga's theory. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, it, watching you in the hotel lobby that night at Comic-Con, it was a passive-aggressive, aggressive anger. It was to, awesome. Who, to the, to the, the female? To the New York lady. Oh, yeah, well, that was, a, that was, that yeah, was you know. That was well played, sir. Mark Ellis, after a few cocktails, having a little bit of fun. With and you and I play. finding that our room dinner had been charged at 44. To sixty bucks more. Yeah, than, you yeah. Know, yeah. We were all a little. <laughs> that Saturday Comic Con gets a little loopy. So Kenny and I are like, yeah, we can charge a ninety dollars <laughs> meal with drinks to <laughs> to this company. Sure, why not? Do it. Um, um, yeah, but I, uh, you, you know, I, I think I, I have a pretty good temperament right now because I have a healthy way to get it out. I, really, I mean, we can't yeah. all we can't all dance it out night after night like Makuga. Makuga can yeah. right? But I, you know, I there's very few things that bother me now. First of all, and yeah, the few things that do. I'm able to get out. I mean, I'm I'm very lucky. I'm in a very cool position where I can go on stage every night of the week and just and just vent, and right. then it's done when I'm off stage. And it, it's a great gift to be able to do that. Yeah. And I didn't always have that outlet, so I yeah. would get in a lot of fights. Really? I, yeah. And um and then it, it but it really turned around for me when <laughs> well all the other guys in school got bigger than me, right. and then it was when I could start making people laugh, and I. Hmm. I I guess I kind of realized that I like doing it in school because I was like the class clown kind of you know really that well that's type. the big question I always yeah. class clowns I always say I have a problem with them yeah. but that what I mean by that is there's the ones who are just kind of the popular kids who rule the roost and then there's the ones like me in the back writing jokes down and practicing them for four months yeah but you seem like that guy I, I'm shocked to hear you say that you were the class clown in the classic sense I was I was right in the middle. Because okay. um, I, I wasn't the kid that's just like when the teacher's calling roll, I'm going to fart. I never, right. I never, like, I wanted to win over everybody. I didn't just mm -hmm. want to get the laughs from my group of friends yeah. making fun of that girl because she's wearing that or making fun of the teacher. Gotcha. I wanted the teacher to laugh. And I wanted the entire classroom to laugh. It wasn't, I didn't want an inside joke. I wanted the entire room to do well. So you were, you were planning TV ready material back then. <laughs> <for sure. Yeah. laughs> I really was. And then, and then the turn happened, I think when you started to get noticed a little bit of notice from girls. Cause I was always, I was in with mm. the popular kids, yeah. but I, b because I was, you know, funny and I had really cool friends. I had really cool friends that would kind of let me tag along. And then mm. you have that, that really weird change that happens to everybody yeah. when the first kid in your class gets his driver's license. Yeah. And it's like, Oh man, Wait, you mean that nobody's dropping us off? We actually get to keep the vehicle? Steve Morris, he can come pick you up. <laughs> yes. I remember that. It was so cool. And your parents were like, okay, now you better be home. But right. I, because it's... Yeah. And, mm. and I was the youngest in the in the class, so okay. I was the last one to have to worry about that kind of stuff. But mm. we could go out, and then everybody would start to date, and girls would come along, and it was this cool kind of thing. And I would be making the girls laugh. And I'm mm. like, this is the coolest thing. This sound coming out of everybody, <laughs> making a sound coming out of someone else's mouth that's positive, it's fun. It's a really good feeling. It's a drug. Yeah. It's addicting. And then a girl asked me to Sadie Hawkins dance. In oh, like really? 10th grade. And I, and I was a chubby kid. I mean, I talked about it. I was, I was fat a, Alice. We're, yeah. yeah, we'll get into Fat Alice. Fat but, Alice, yeah. You know, I, I, how fat? Is the question because I've seen I knew you doing your quote fat Ellis phase here in L.A. Yeah. and you weren't a fat guy. It was I was chubby. Um, okay, I was chubby in L.A. I was a little. I was pretty. I wasn't like I wasn't obese, but I was. You know, I was definitely okay. I'll have to see some see some picture proof, but uh, uh, there, 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 there's a good one of me uh, next to uh, Daryl Green. Uh, we went to Redskins training camp when I was in sixth grade, and we're taking a picture. And like me and Daryl Green have like the same size head. Like, it looks like it's a uh, <laughs> juvenile diabetes uh, charity event that Daryl Green's appearing at. Yeah, yeah. Daryl's looking at my head like this thing should be on Easter Island. What is? <laughs> I'd like to intercept this head and run it back for six. Oh man! So, at what point did stand up or a career in comedy come into your focus? Mm, um, you didn't go to college uh, for that, obviously. No, no. I could have gone to. Uh, Tallahassee Clown College. <laughs> there actually is a clown college oh, yeah. in Tallahassee. It's not called Florida State. I get, there's two of them. I get you. Um, <laughs> they, I, I think, 
I didn't really think about it before I went to Wake, before, before mm. I went to college. And then I always kind of had it, like, I wasn't the most prepared kid to go to college. I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this and this is going to be my career. Right. Yeah. I had it in my back pocket that maybe I'll, I'll, I'll upload on, or, you know, front load on some science classes mm-hmm. just in case I get bit by that medical bug. Right. And my first biology class just got rid of any <laughs> thought in my head of becoming a doctor. My biology class, I hated it so much. Mm-hmm. I, the, the first te- I don't remember what I got on the first test. I get the second exam back. And it says 52, nice improvements on my face. <laughs> and when getting half the questions right <laughs> is a nice improvement, it, you better be funny. My chemistry class is where I learned to play poker. <laughs> like, true story. So that's where. Yeah. And I was one of those smart kids on the four year plan in mm-hmm. high school to go to college. Oh, really? I made my economics teacher laugh with my homework or my test answers the first week of economics. Didn't do a work the rest of it. Just said, talked to her like yeah. I was a friend. Yeah. Like, I made some reference to James K. Polk, the 11th president of the United States of America. And she that's pretty funny. Oh, yeah. Last work I did. So I was an underachieving student yeah. so i know what you mean yeah i wasn't underachieving because i didn't have a goal right, you, right. you can't underachieve if there's nothing really to aim yeah. for i just kind of assumed that something would grab me in college and i think a lot of people make that mistake because you're 18 when you go to college and when mm. i was going to college i was just worried i just didn't want to be homesick i just wanted mm. to be able to live in the dorm and meet new people and and have a nice circle of friends i didn't care about you know figuring out what i wanted to do and then I stumble upon communications mm. and one of the classes, it was a speech class. And I'm like, because I like making people laugh and I yeah. like being funny. And I was like, all right, let's, let's see how this works. And I just, I love being in front of people. Yeah. And it just, it, it started to click like, oh, maybe I can sneak a joke in here. Maybe I can sneak a joke in here. Mm. And I give presentations and just when the time, you know, you'd plan it out with whoever else you were giving the presentation with. And then when it actually came to do the presentation, yeah. you just go. Yeah, you just you dominate and you make people laugh, and the teachers looking at it like, hey, I don't know what grade I'm getting, but Doesn't I got matter. the laughs. So yeah. who cares? I, I remember in eighth grade, I did my book report on Robert Louis Stevenson as Dennis Miller at Weekend Update. <laughs> Good evening. Here's the news, and what can I tell you? <laughs> Robinson C- C- Caruso was on the, you know, I, I, and you know that's what Treasure I was doing. Treasure Island, babe. Treasure Island, babe. <laughs> I Captain Hairdo. <laughs> Yeah, that uh, Dennis Miller show was a that was a gem that that, that, that still lives on YouTube, I guess. The, yeah. His HBO half hour show, yeah. that he had every Friday, Dennis Miller Live. It was so good. I love Miller in all incarnations, whether it be a weird conservative or a raging liberal. I love them all. Yeah, I'm actually, I, I saw when I first started doing stand up, I saw I was driving out here and driving back and forth across the country, and I stopped in Denver on the way back and saw <laughs> him because I knew he was going to be there. And I saw him at the Comedy Works. Nice. And it was just I remember sitting in the club and just thinking like, this is this is it. This is it. It felt like a dungeon. You go right. downstairs, and it's like, all right. Yeah. And, but but he was great, and yeah. the guy who came on before him was great. And you're watching this, and you're like, this is this could be a thing. And then, or this, I guess, a few months ago, I was at Denver Comedy Works, nice. and I was the guy on you, stage. You were the guy, yeah. And it was uh, it was just a trip. Man. So what? At what point then, um, do does it turn into a career aspiration for you? Um, did you come all the way out here to L.A. to find that, or no, you found it back then? It had been formed by then because okay. I started uh, I started dating a girl, the the longest and best relationship uh, oh. that I've had to this. You point. peaked early, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I I had a great rookie season, and <laughs> then there you go. yeah, I was like, it was it Ernie Davis? I had like yeah. a great rookie year, and then I just got <laughs> some disease, and you know, it's Bob Hamlin with the uh, the ninety two Royals. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he win the Rookie of the Year? Yeah, he's delivering UPS now. <laughs> but he's got that frame-rated rookie. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be damned if that didn't get him some ladies back that one year in Kansas City. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I think I realized that I wanted to do stand-up while I was dating her because I graduated mm-hmm. from college. And the last two credits I needed were I took a theater class. And okay. you could you know you had to prepare a monologue and do all this other crap. The monologue that I prepared was from another you know source. And I did Dennis Leary's... Uh, one of his no cure for cancer rants. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so, and I performed that. Um, it was legal to steal. It, I just, when it, it was, you had to, it was, it had to be from another source. So that's. <laughs> but ironically, he gave credit to Bill Hicks. So it's. <laughs> yeah, I just cut out the middleman. I yeah, said that was yeah. by, that was by Bill Leary, but one of the two. <laughs> and, um, and, and so I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And then I had a buddy um, from high school, one of the cool kids mm-hmm. who always let me hang out, yeah. uh, Doug Whitehead. He moved out to LA. How, how does Doug Whitehead become a cool kid? That's uh, a tough name. He, he was really cool. He persevered, man. He that is was, cool. He had just, his hair was just that good. <laughs> that is Arsenio level cool, yeah, man. It was unbelievable. He was the white Arsenio. <laughs> 
He, uh, but he was one of those guys who always had a girlfriend. Then he moved yeah. out to L.A. because he wanted to, to direct. He wanted to work in film. Okay. And so he was already out here. And um, he went to Florida State. Okay. He graduated from Florida State. Oh, that's the connection. Okay. There you go. I know where uh, it's going, yeah. Yeah, Christian Harloff also went to that clown university. And yeah. then, uh, I got into Florida State. I, and I almost went to Florida State, actually. It was your backup backup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and so Doug was living out here, and he had just broken up with his girlfriend. And I knew Doug was out there, and I it was like New York or L.A. Because I didn't mm-hmm. want to... I had done a couple open mics around the Southeast. My first time on stage was great, and I loved mm. it. And then every other time was just bombing. Yeah. You know, wearing a Hawaiian shirt, thinking, oh, they got to know I'm funny. I mean, how how are they going to know I'm a comedian unless I'm, like... It's the Bruce Baum school of comedy I, there, isn't it? <laughs> I looked at it like it was getting into the Friars Club. Like, they're not going to let you in and on stage unless you have a Hawaiian shirt. It's it, it will, They'll provide one for you if yeah. you need it. And... um. And and it just wasn't going well, but I knew I wanted to do it, and so and it wasn't going great with me and my girlfriend, and so mm. I, I broke up with her on um, I think on like a Monday, and then I left on a Thursday, wow, I think, on the following Thursday. I'm out of here from North Carolina, I'm chasing my dreams. Yeah, we, it was a mutual kind of thing, and my parents weren't weren't thrilled about it. Um, yeah. They 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 had the reservations um, <laughs> about me breaking up with her and doing stand up. The twofold. So they must yeah. they must have liked her. We're hoping for a nice marriage, and maybe a doctor career, yeah. and some kids. Yeah. And you're like throwing it all away. Yeah, yeah. But then they'd at least given up the doctor dream. But actually, okay. what I was doing that is I was I was interning at a news station that oh, summer okay. at uh, WXII in uh, in Winston Salem, and I was an intern. And I hated it. As soon as I got there, I hated it. I went out to go get donuts and coffee yeah. one morning, and, and just never came back. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're still waiting for their donuts and coffee. It, still. It, Mark Ellis ain't coming back. And so, yeah, then I moved and then I left. And uh, the night before, uh, my dad took me to Hooters in Williamsburg. Outstanding. Or, uh, in uh, in Winston-Salem, where all men bond. Yeah. Hooters. And he was just, he asked me a couple of, you know, dad questions where you're supposed to. Yeah. And then, you know, I told him I had a good enough game plan. I go sleep on Doug's couch for a while, see what happens. And he was looking at me and he's like, all right, then go do it. And hmm. so I did. So I left and then I stayed in Nashville the first night and I went to the comedy club there called Zanies. Yeah. And Dane Cook was the was the attraction. Okay. And I sat in the front row and I was a big fan of his. Yeah. So I had, you know, seen uh his Comedy Central special, had Harmful Swallowed, and he gets on stage and just just murders. Yeah. You know, for an hour. He's just a force of nature up there. And I'm just sitting in the front row watching. I'm like, I this is I can do this. Yeah. And then I had that moment back in the hotel. After the show, and Those I'm damn like, hotels. I'm like, I could, I could drive back. I could drive back. I'm still close enough. I could get back together with her. Say I'm sorry. I could do this. And just something inside just said, just keep driving another day. What happened see to where it goes? What happened to her? Um, we're still really good friends. Okay. Yeah. So she, she's fine. She lives in, uh, she lives in Florida. Okay. Now I actually just saw her at the Fort Lauderdale when I was doing Fort Lauderdale at the Improv. She, oh, she came out with she her. She made me try sushi for the first time. No, really? Uh, oh, that's monumental. There's video footage. Oh, yeah, I guess no, the, and no one knows. I, I had sushi. Wow. I tried sushi it, once. It changes everything. I know. Wow. Look out, ladies. Mark yeah. Ellis is now dateable material. This, this Schmelz Podcast Episode 7 draft just went out the window. <laughs> the only reason we were doing that is to make you do sushi. I'm not mainlining Mercury by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> but if, it, if that's what it takes, then yes, I can have a bite. So there was no regret. She didn't like uh, grow up to be the princess of some land, and uh, you know, and you would look no. at and say that's a life. I'd still want uh, for a few years. Yeah, okay, even after I was still like, I wonder if there's a way we can get back together and mm. something like that. And eventually, all that stuff does just kind of you fall by the wayside. And you just yeah. realize that, that life's a lot bigger, and you just uh, you kind of file it away. And then eventually, it doesn't. It just doesn't hurt anymore. It just, yeah, it just doesn't. Yeah, you, know? you wake up one day and you're like, oh, I'm all right. Yeah, I'm I'm good. It's it's not bad being single. I get to determine when I shower. We are not going to cry to a five for fighting song today. We're going to move on. Yeah. Uh, so you hit the big city. You meet Christian Harloff. Does that lead to stand up, or you had already started? I, that's part of the story yeah. I've never understood. I had already been doing some open mics. Cause okay. Because Doug lived right off Sunset, and so I could walk to the Laugh Factory. I could walk yeah. to the Comedy Store. I had done a few open mics. I had done the store potluck. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, which we all know is just a ball of laughs. <laughs> and, um, I, uh, and then Doug introduced me to Christian cause he knew somebody who was, you know, who was doing well in stand up. who yeah. was, you know, he, he said, Doug had seen him at the improv and he said he was hilarious. And, uh, you know, so he, we went to this barbecue that he was having and it's just Harloff mm-hmm. being Harloff. Yeah. Just, right. You know, king shit. Especially back then. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Just sipping Corona's grilling chicken. There's some ladies of ill repute in the corner that you didn't question why you're there. Yeah. There. You were just glad they were. Like, <laughs> yeah. And I was that, I was that new to town asshole with dyed yeah. blonde hair, some, some silly looking <laughs> ACDC shirt from Tommy Bahama. And, um, and that, but he's like, yeah, you hooked me up with this gig at, um, 
the uh, El Dorado. El Dorado, I think. Yeah, yeah. Which which we we now may determine might have been the first place I've seen you. I always thought it was the comedy store belly room. Oh, you narrowed it down. But I used to go. I used to perform at the El Dorado a lot too. So that might have been it because yeah. I did a comedy contest there, mm-hmm. which is which you know yeah. invite friends because they're oh, the ones voting. It's a racket. And the first time I did the first, I, I made it through the first round, and mm-hmm. I had a and I had a really good set, and I'm like, oh, I got this comedy got thing it. handled. Yeah. And then the second round, I just. Who, uh, Maybe that's when you saw me. Was it Franco know. and TK's? I think so. Yeah. Rebels, the Rebels yeah. of Comedy stand-up contest. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I was, I was in. Uh, that's exactly what it was. One of yeah. those. Yeah. Did you go further than me? Did you? No, I did not. I had to keep paying to get on to further <laughs> rounds to try again because I really thought I was investing in my career at this point. Uh-huh. Uh, no, I, I got knocked out because I had to follow someone who eventually became a really good friend of mine, Triana Gamaza, who was uh, at the time doing stand-up and had kind of based her whole, whole act on being a stripper for a hot second, and so she yeah. comes up and does all the stripper material, pulls her shirt up the hooting and hollering it and then i come up on stage after 30 pounds heavier than i am now like hi i hate myself like <laughs> here's what my tits look like <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and uh yeah so i think we we're probably in the same contest um and, and i gotta clear the air here we've mentioned it uh before on this podcast and on other uh outlets i always joke my first impression of mark ellis my memories are is yeah curly haired kid not that funny <laughs> And it's amazing how many people still agree with you. <laughs> Not that I was any funnier as a stand-up back then. This is what oh three. When did you start? Yeah, March of uh, March of oh three was when I I landed. It was when I hit Plymouth Rock. That's great. I started my stand-up career started March twenty third two thousand three. Oh, really? That's when I started, because I'd been uh, voted out of the Groundlings in December 2002, yeah. moped around, tried to kill myself, played a lot of Madden football, then Peter Sprite and Brian Keith Etheridge are like, get up on stage, stand yeah. up. Well, if you're listening to this podcast, you can tell this is 20 years of comedy <laughs> expertise coming <laughs> yeah, at yeah. you. Um, so, wow, we started about the same time. You're so much more uh, better than me. Um, <laughs> you've so much put some effort into this. Yeah, but, um, I, you know, it's, it's it, but I learned really, uh, doing that show, mm-hmm. that, that bringer shows are not what, are not where it's at. This is not. Yeah. Yeah. going to help you and a lot of comics fall into that trap for a long time where promoters will tell them hey uh, you know bring your friends if you bring 10 friends then mm-hmm. I'll give you 10 minutes of stage time mm-hmm. and you can go up in front of your friends with some dick jokes and yeah. see how it goes and it can go really well and I just I didn't like any part of that I didn't even like seeing my friends after the show even yeah. if it did well I didn't I didn't like seeing people I knew in the crowd I wanted to do this thing for strangers and yeah. then if it goes well, great. If it doesn't go well, then I'll have to go home and retool and work on some stuff. But mm-hmm. I hated bringer shows really early on. And I just got out of doing it. And so the training is a lot harder mm-hmm. when you just go through the open mic and nobody's making phone calls to get you made a regular anywhere. But right. I think it, it does it does end up paying dividends much later. Well, I think well, I think it did. So that's why I want to ask you. And part of the joke, I say, yeah, uh, you're curly haired, not funny. <laughs> it, it, we all start out that way, and no matter how yeah. funny you were before, and and you clearly are a tremendously funny human being, and oh, you always sweet. were, like you said, and you may claim your family uh, is funnier than you, but you're funny. Yeah. It still has to translate to the stage, and you still have to work on it. So yeah. that then time had passed, and I didn't do the comedy store, and I wasn't there for a while, and then I, you kind of reappear on the scene. I'm like, oh, I remember this guy. <laughs> Wait, maybe that's not the same guy, because this guy's hilarious. Uh, this is about 2007 now. Yeah. Um, so what went into that approach? How, how did you build yourself up uh, and learn this business? Four words. World famous comedy store. Okay. is it, I was doing Potluck there forever, which is mm-hmm. their version of the open mic, and then you, if you are sane and you can get some laughs on stage doing that, then and you're in the right, you know, career path. You can get a job there, mm-hmm. like answering phones and working the door, or selling tickets, all that stuff. Yeah. And so I got into that, which is great because then you're guaranteed two spots a week on Sunday and Monday. You can do employee spots, and that's working in front of a crowd. And mm-hmm. it's it, the store is the hardest place to do stand up. It really is yeah. tough. Absolutely. It's a tough room. All three of them. The belly room, the original yeah. room, and the main room. And and the parking lot. And the parking lot is maybe the toughest room. Yeah. Um, but everybody's high back there, so you can get a couple <laughs> courtesy laughs. And, uh, yeah, I just started working my way up through that through that system. And you watch the best uh, yeah. of what that store has to offer, mm-hmm. you know. And so I'd watch guys like, like Christian would be going up then. Yeah. And you'd see guys like Renazizi mm-hmm. and uh, John Caparulo and Sebastian and mm-hmm. and those guys go up and just and you watch them develop new material and see how their sets would shift from like a Tuesday late night crowd to a Saturday packed main room mm. kind of thing yeah. and you just and you watch these guys you're like that's what I want to be I I want to be that guy that's just always here and is just working on stuff and just that's where I want to live so I did 
Yeah, and you do, and you live on stage, man. That's where that's where you're. Uh, you know, we'll wrap things up at like midnight. I'm I'm doing a set at the store, <laughs> Mark. It's one a.m. I you. Yeah. It's it, there's a homeless guy there. Correct, then you know. I have no idea how to relax anymore. Yeah, because I'm like Jeffrey Jones in Beetlejuice, a, a very underrated comic performance. Remember the beginning when he's just he moves into this house in the middle of nowhere and he's just trying to relax. Yeah, and he's just rocking in his chair and he's looking at birds and he's fidgety because he doesn't know how to relax. That's me. I wanted to take this whole week and just relax and just right. just work on schmo stuff. And I'm driving over here and I was like. I, kind of got the i'm, I'm yeah. gonna call the improv and, call the improv dude set yeah. tonight yeah i was i was uh, i had to bump the time up about 20 minutes tonight and i'm like oh man he's probably got a set somewhere <laughs> that's <laughs> no. why i texted you today like is it gonna be okay yeah. um so at what point did you start to see some some turnaround or dividends in your career and your performance at what point did you grow uh you start you start becoming regulars at mm-hmm. becoming a regular at these clubs uh, called yeah. what's called a paid regular meaning now yeah. you get paid to do spots and you can call in your availability for the week so um, but I got made a regular at the, I think at the Improv first, and then the Laugh Factory, and the Comedy Store, my home, my yeah. RFK. Yeah. Just it, it just didn't happen. And okay. you know, I'd showcase in front of Mitzi, mm-hmm. and she just yeah, yeah, come yeah, back tomorrow. Yeah. You're too yeah. cocky. What? I, I'm on stage. I'm supposed to believe in myself, right? And um, and I just keep getting denied there, but I kept working there. So I had mm-hmm. spots, mm-hmm. and that was just – it just becomes a running joke after a while when you're in with a group of guys, and you're like, who's going to get passed first? Who's, uh-huh. And then some outside will come in and get passed right away. And you're like, why is that guy getting passed? Mm-hmm. Why is she getting passed? And then you finally – I finally got passed to the comedy store, and that's when I – and I owe a lot to my buddy Rick Ingram because he mm-hmm. was you know, he was doing well. We were kind of in the same generation. He got passed before me, gotcha. and he kept putting a word in for me, and finally it happened around – Christmas and it was just all right sweet this next year I get to do spots at the three best clubs in LA right and then fill in the blanks in between and I can just start doing this and doing it every night and that was it that was a huge thing for me and how much time do you put in um off stage um here, here's the way I'll, I'll phrase it to those listening when you when you date a girl for the first and it's in the early stages and you're like oh i'm doing a stand-up they oh i want to go see every show and they assume <laughs> that for the seven to 20 minutes you're on stage that's all that's all that's where it ends it's all magic you yeah. just kind of magic made it up yeah. and um you know my, my roommate lou santini he did sometimes four hours a day working yeah. and fine-tuning jokes uh-huh. how much time do you put into it off stage it, it depends depends on what my the other half of my life allows the what what schmoes mm-hmm. does mm-hmm. because schmoes is, is those are the two kind of jobs that i have now and i'm not because i have two the two of the five best jobs in the world sure i think but um, they're still jobs they are still jobs and you still got to put work in yeah them. and so it mainly happens when i'm when i'm on the road i mean i can uh, mm. you know i can fly out on a, i'll take a red eye wednesday and if I'm already finished with whatever the Shmo thing of the day was, then good. And I can start to look at my set and see. Because when I'm on the road, I, I like to – I have maybe two or three jokes that I want to work in. Mm-hmm. Like new new things or new ideas or just even just tweak this word or get rid of that line and replace it with that line. Yeah. And that's the goal by the end of the week is to have these new ideas ingratiated into a set that already has worked. Hmm. So if you can do that, then so I think – still break it down by that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you, then you just write kind of stream of consciousness. Is, you have, and your style, I, I'm, I'm struggling to describe it right now in my head, but it's... Um, it's great. It's great. It's big, no, seriously, it's great. Uh, um, uh, you and Cap, that show at the Ice House, when we had Johns and Stockman and Flickpick out oh, here, yeah, man, that, that was, was a great showing. Um, but uh, it's it's conversational, it's story, but it, it's not it's not joke, joke and bit, joke and bit. It, mm-hmm. it is all interwoven. It is a, it is a, a journey of who you are, but it's so fine-tuned. So, so that you're saying it goes down to the word then. You're getting dangerously close to describing it as one man show. And that, that's, a, that's <laughs> yes. a word that scares the hell out of yeah, me. It does me too. Yeah. It's, it's uh, a one man show. But picture stand up comedy with just less laughs. <laughs> Mark Ellis, the light that never went out. Yeah. Now at the North Hollywood Theater. Across from Henry's Tacos. Yeah. Let's take out this 30 minutes of jokes and then just put in a really sad story about <laughs> drug addiction and see if they like it. It's just, it was never my thing. But um, It's not mine either. Not my thing, yeah. I mean, I, I, I look at it, um, I, I just kind of look at it, the way I present stuff on stage is just very, very kind of in the moment. There's mm-hmm. obviously, there's jokes that I've been doing for years that I still do, but I always like it to, to be spontaneous. And I like to, because the first time I, I was on stage, that was what I took away from it. Yeah. Is that as soon as I put the first foot on stage and I looked out in the crowd, I was like, oh, I'm still here. Yeah, it's I can still think there's still a guy at the wheel. It's not like, oh, it's gonna, I'm going to have this out of body experience mm-hmm. and I'm just going to watch this guy do the jokes that I had meticulously written out. It was no, I can surf with the crowd. I can talk to that guy. Yeah. Or I cannot do this joke that I was planning on opening with and instead 
cut to here. So it's a lot like like, like Peyton Manning at the uh, line of scrimmage. <laughs> I was waiting to get it out. Yeah. Yeah. You're calling the audibles. Yeah. You, you get yeah. on stage and sometimes it's just it's just nice easy drive, and other times yeah. you just it's a tough crowd and you got to back up and. Or you, you know, got a you know a, a bachelorette party is there and they're, oh, you know they're swinging yeah. dildos in the air and screaming and oh, hooting and hollering. Or, yeah, just or, dude, or, become the fire marshal for five. Yeah, minutes. who uh, who some of your uh, influences in comedy outside of because you might answer some of the guys you just mentioned that you grew up watching, which for me too. When people would ask me when I was doing stand up, who are your favorite stand ups? Uh-huh. Uh, Lou Santini, Christian Harloff, yeah. Jamie Kaler, you know uh, yeah. those guys that I saw every night. Yeah, outside of those guys, who were some of your Outside of those guys, and then, you know, like a lot of those guys and people who I could watch early at the Mm -hmm. store, watch them develop their career Mm -hmm. before me, um, I would say uh, Bill Cosby, Mm -hmm. um, Bill, I guess Bill Burr counts. Sure. Um, Because he still comes into the store and we're kind of, you know, we can talk, but it's, it's, that's, that's Bill Burr. That's Bill Burr, yeah. yeah. Um, David Tell and, um, and Dane Cook, I'm telling you, man, he, because he hit me at the right time and he made stand up cool. Yeah, he he made it, it. It's always been a neat art form to do, a respected art form, as much as we like to pretend it's not. Sure, but he made it this this really cool rock and roll kind of thing again. Mm-hmm. And seeing what he did, no one else was like that. You're not going to get an argument for me about Dan Cook as a comic. Like yeah. uh, I, I get the negative sides. Uh, I get when something becomes so popular, we all want to mm-hmm. tear it down. I get all that, mm-hmm. and I get that he may have there may have been some theft issues. I get it. I yeah. get it. Yeah, uh, it doesn't take away. That he's a spectacular performer and comic, and and I saw him light up a twenty five audience member room at the Improv <laughs> on a Sunday night at like eleven. Yeah, comes just tore it up as yeah. if it was a, a sold out show. And I remember thinking, and I'm in the audience, and I'm thinking, yeah, why why would I hate this? Why would I hate this guy? Yeah, um, Rogan is another one. Is also mm-hmm. from Boston. Who I, because he would come into the comedy store before him and Mar- him and Carlos Mencia got in a fight mm-hmm. on stage at the comedy. Oh store. yeah, oh yeah. And the comedy store, I, I love it to death. They just they they, they backed the wrong horse when mm-hmm. they they continue to put Carlos's name on the marquee and then Joe hasn't been back and it's it's really sad because Joe would come in on Saturday and work the OR the, the mm-hmm. original room and he would do an hour on stage and it was always packed and you had four or five comics go on in front of Joe yeah. and then four or five guys go on the tail end of Joe and right when I got made a regular I could start riding some of that wave and learning how to follow a beast mm-hmm. like that yeah and also you get to watch him develop material in mm-hmm. an hour setting in a room that intimate it was really a, a learning experience to watch and um but mm-hmm. yeah, guys like that, and then, I mean, when I was a kid, I always tried to stay up to to tape Eddie Murphy Raw. Oh yeah, like after yeah. my parents fell asleep, sneak downstairs and try to watch it because I love Beverly Hills Cop too. Yeah, I loved that, and then I'm like, I want to see this guy by himself. And when when I saw Raw for the first time, finally, yeah, just I mean, all I wanted to do was grow up and be a great black comic. After that, that's all I wanted <laughs> out of life. In a, in a Hawaiian shirt, <laughs> uh, yeah, Bill Cosby too. Bill Cosby himself, the, you know, that's the thing that got me laughing mm-hmm. first as a kid. You know, yeah. um, still the best. If I could yeah. put together my perfect show of opener, uh, feature act, headliner, mm-hmm. I would probably have Dangerfield open. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have Sam Kinison middle, okay, and then I would have Bill Cosby headline. Because that's- whatever Kinison can do to that stage, however he can tear it apart and crush the crowd. Bill Cosby can go on stage, sit down on the stool, and just bring it right back yeah. and just murder for hours. Yeah. Yeah, he does two two and a half hour shows sometimes, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what the legends you hear, you know. Yeah, and he's just he's just fall down funny, and he's yeah. not he's not dirty. He's telling stories about his childhood, yeah. and that's my big. That's what I've been working on recently is trying to get into some of that stuff, like you know, road trips and mm-hmm. you know shit like that that you grow up with, and just watching somebody like him do it. Yeah, is or prior just take these stories and turn it into just stand up gold. It's it's fantastic to watch. Yeah, I'm trying to think off the top of my head some of your stand up, which you can listen to on Get to the Castle, available uh, for purchase through uh, what your website now yeah. uh, uh, iTunes, iTunes, Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. Amazon. Finally, Amazon. get to the plug. Uh, it's yeah. been great. Thank you so yeah. much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to go through your act right now quickly in my head, and it is it's a lot of self deprecation. It's yeah. a lot of uh, Star Wars bed sheets. It's a lot of that. But uh, yeah, it is definitely you get. To to know you and to go on that uh-huh. journey so you're accomplishing that and, and and you've got such a long way to go i mean what are you early 30s now i forget yeah, your age you're yeah. young you're younger than yeah. gray beards like me and i just off. turned 21 it's just very, turned 21. very exciting yeah. i believe it um by your actions at buffalo wild wings <laughs> um I get to have beer now? <laughs> My actions at Buffalo Wild Wings are like a kid with a fake ID. Like, I can't believe they're buying this. Wings and beer? <laughs> um, if only the wait staff was hot. Yeah. Man, what a revelation that would be. They're like C pluses. Yeah. Mark, no, one day we'll take you to Hooters when you're old enough. 
uh, or tilted kilt now. Um, <laughs> uh, so you've got a long way to go. That's what's so exciting for me as a fan of your work. You know, you're just getting r- warmed up. I I think so. I think uh, the great thing about Schmoes too is how and you know to, to Christians. Um, uh, you know, he's been really cool about letting one hand wash the other because he doesn't do stand up anymore. Right. He um, raises a kid. Yeah, but it's thank God that guy did stand up. And he mm-hmm. was and he was at the level that he was because yeah. he understands the, the, the draw of it. And yeah. he thinks that sometimes it's like I'm just I'm powerless against this thing. And yeah. I know it doesn't sound exciting. Hey, I gotta boogie and go to Jacksonville, Florida for the weekend. Can you yeah. take care of the the other baby named Schmo, right. and and he's like, no, he he understands that it's, yeah. that's the way that I have chosen to pay my bills, and now we have this other thing that is doing really well for us. So it, it's it's a nice back and forth, mm-hmm. and then you know I have some stuff that hopefully that I can get on TV sooner than later. You know, it's been a couple of good weeks in that mm. in that, but it's always been a couple of good weeks, and then <laughs> you're one joke away from I'm, I'll do a late show. A, a late night talk show this year mm-hmm. by the end of this year and then there's another one that wants one joke out and one joke in and it's just it comes down to that huh yeah and it's so frustrating because they're always like oh no we love it just just take this joke out and then we're good and it's like well no, you, do you not understand that that that's the pin this is ikea furniture yeah it's not built to last if so, i take that pin out the whole operation it's a, it's a comedy jenga set yeah, <laughs> you're pulling things yeah. out uh, this is an ed sullivan telling the doors to change you know desire oh man um, go back and watch those ed sullivan shows it's, it is fantastic <laughs> dude, God. on the road is that what you do it's a lot of fun to youtube watch the guy don't watch the beatles the beatles are great yeah don't watch the beatles watch the, the beatles first appearance in america on the ed sullivan show on february right. what 12th 1964 mm-hmm. and watch the guy that had to follow the Beatles. That's where the comedian goes. Everybody else is like, hey, the Beatles, they're playing all my love and this is great. The comics, we want to see who can follow that. And it's a magician. And it does not go well. Because that guy just, he comes on stage, he's a total pro. He's got that cocky look in his eye. He's probably done Sullivan ten times. He probably told the Beatles backstage, like, hey, you you guys talking funny. Good luck with your first time, Rook. Let me know how it goes after. I can get your seats at the Magic Castle. Oh, man, you just see the look in this guy's eye a minute in when he realizes this is not, Mm. I'm following something special here. Society has changed right between the commercial break. It is set. I don't know who I'd rather follow less, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan or Robin Williams at the Morgan Mindy audition. (laughs) Those are two just legendary stories of just monster crushing. And then who is possibly going to follow this? No one can. No one. I got to take that reference in for a little and process that. Uh, do, you, do you want, what are your other aspirations? You don't, do you act? Do you write? Uh, you know, you got a screenplay hidden in your drawer? No. The, You're the, just stand up, huh? Yeah, the writing. I mean, the thing that I've really always admired about Christian is his mental, uh, his, his, his mental energy, mm-hmm. what he has, because he can, he can just go all day and he gets ideas and this and this and this. And I, mm-hmm. I do something and then I need a nap. <laughs> I, I can't. I don't have the. I don't have the wherewithal to do it. And writing, yeah. I, I. I don't think I'm bad at writing, but I. <laughs> I'm good at writing. I write good. <laughs> Me gooder. I just don't have the. Uh, I just don't have the desire. And I've been offered yeah. you know, like spots to write on on shows. Oh really? Some of what you know. They, Based they, off your stand up work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. People see me at clubs. They, you know, it's a, it's a young comic. He was funny. Uh, you want to write for this show? And I've turned some stuff down even recently where it's like, I just don't, I don't love mm-hmm. it. It's, it, I don't care what it pays. It, it, sure. I don't love doing it. It's not what I'm, what That's I. That's what you don't want to do 16 hours a day in a writer's, writer's room or something <laughs> like that. If you don't, if, you know, passion is where your passion is, man. Yeah. And I don't work well with others. I, I, <laughs> I, I really, I really don't. I'm fine hanging out <laughs> and having beers with the boys and playing pickup ball on the weekends. But that's a, that's a great thing about Schmoes is that, is that me and Christian vibe well because he yeah. knows that, like, that's why I love doing stand up because it's just me up there. Improv? Yeah. No. Sketch? Absolutely right. not. I don't trust other people on stage in front of a live audience. I simply don't. I love you, Ken. You're one of my best buds out here. You get us on a stage. Really? I, you want to go first? You want me to go first? Because I don't want to do this at the same time. Wow. I just... I, and of not and, trusting me? Of it, On stage. Off stage, I'm sure... Do I get that on stage? Yeah. I'll take you through it, buddy. I, <laughs> I'll get you there. I get you there, man. A lot of improv training in my background, man. Yeah. Yes, yes and. and. Uh, yes, and, see? man. Add info. It, um, I just never deny. Um, That's the acting thing, too, is, is I enjoy acting in, in spurts. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I won't say no to do I've done a couple commercials this year because that's yeah. one or two days on set. Yeah. Um, but I don't like, I really just don't like being on set. It's like, it's, again, it's 16 hours and it's just, it's yeah. just wasted energy and you got to do all this nonsense. And 
it's just not my it's just not my passion. You, you got to get up at five to go take a nap on set, and it's what yeah. I've learned. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a nice change of pace. Sometimes I like to challenge myself with yeah. a new artistic endeavor, but more often than not, at the end of that week, I'm like, oh, thank God I got mm-hmm. shows and I got stand up. Mm-hmm. Um, are you really an asexual platypus? <laughs> I was sitting on eggs when you called today. And <laughs> I don't know where the old lady was, but I just sit on the eggs, keep them warm till they hatch. Where does Mark Ellis stand on love relationships, uh, wife and kid? That's the big debate right now. Makuga and I just, you know, uh, hammered it. I heard you guys. You know, hammered it. And, and Harloff's giving us a lot of crap for that. Probably yeah. uh, just. Um, you guys were like, you know, yeah. pools of batting practice, just just knocking marriage. Get out Mark. of here. It's like me and an animated movie. Take that elsewhere. <laughs> uh, I'm definitely that way with kids. Um, yeah. As far as not, I don't see it in, in the immediate future. Um, yeah. Or the occasion I'll see a movie and I'm like, oh, that'd be nice if I could... If I yeah. could adopt a ten-year-old, or you know, like, like I could move into an apartment and there'd be some abandoned kid and he just kind of comes and hangs out and I feed him right. every now and again, but then he leaves, does his own thing. When I turn seventy, I want to adopt a, a family <laughs> to come around during the holidays. That's why you have kids. Yeah, it, you're, you're having a lottery ticket so that when you get old and can't take care of yourself anymore, one of them is going to be successful enough <laughs> to, to pay it. for it. To do it. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. If you have kids, have six. Yeah. You know. Build a farm team. Yeah, you're you're at the blackjack table. Get, split split your cards. I Double down. Marriage is is something I I think I could get behind marriage. You can okay. Yeah, I, but I just I just turned the corner on like yeah maybe I could use a girlfriend because I didn't really? want, I, I didn't want anything I didn't want anybody in my life for a long time and I still I really like being alone but I it, really enjoy yeah it. that's what we all share that's what we all share we're all career driven and and if I'm not working on my career I kind of mm-hmm. feel like I'm wasting time and yeah. that's that's I hate to say that to some some not just women but friends in my life yeah. I get a lot of guys hey can't we have it? it's been about three years um are you I, I can't have you as a guest on my podcast so sorry <laughs> we're gonna have to hang out next month sorry yeah. It's the nature of the beast, too. I mean, what 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 I do is is nocturnal. It's yeah, it, you don't get up until you know nine o'clock at night. Then you're then you get that second wind. It just is the training. It's like oh, yeah. I, I got I got three spots and I got to go do this and this and this. And that's when most people. That's when the teachers of the world are yeah. coming home and they're unwinding. They want to have a glass of wine mm-hmm. and talk about their day. And this kid hit on me, and this kid can't cut right, so we can't pass him <laughs> on to kindergarten. And I'm going out, babe. I'm leaving. I gotta go. I gotta go do. I gotta go to work. Yeah. And I think that's so. It's hard to meet people. Yeah, you don't who, who aren't stand ups. Oh, you don't yeah. you don't want to date a stand up? Did you ever date? A, did you ever date a stand up? Um, I did briefly. Yeah, in two thousand and six. Mm-hmm. When I say briefly, I mean about three weeks. Yeah, <laughs> and um, yeah, it's uh, it was a uh, it was fine. It just it happened so quick. But even in that time frame, I felt a little one upmanship on my part. Like, oh, she got that gig. Yeah, hmm. yeah. I think my jokes are better. I think yeah. I'll, you know. Yeah, that's. So I couldn't. I couldn't see that working long term. I would stick to uh, waitresses. Oh, that's I. The that's my, bane of my existence. Oh my. <laughs> me too. God. Uh, um, and I know that they're flirting for money, but I've <laughs> I've left the worst I've left. I had a nine dollar bill at a Chili's at Northridge, at a bar. I'm sitting there by myself, mm-hmm. yeah. writing in my book, writing some screenplay ideas yeah, that never I got, got her right where I want her. Yeah. And um, Allison was her name, I remember, and I had a nine dollar thirty two cent bill, and I left her eleven dollar tip, <laughs> thinking that will do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's probably spent that on her boyfriend, but uh, uh, yeah, I'd fall for it every time. <laughs> yeah, it's and and even when I go to clubs on the road, it's there's always a hot waitress. Yeah, and but then I, I'm mature enough now to think in the back of my head they get hit on by every comic. Yes. It is blown through that club. So yeah. I just honestly, I just try to play it cool. And what what I'm in the mode right now is because it's almost fall. So mm-hmm. I say like, all right, I'll give it the rest of this year. And then boom, January 1st, Match.com. Let's do this. Let You hook me up with somebody. So <laughs> This would be a great show. We got to pitch that show right now. <laughs> Ellis finds love. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually a good fall lover, though. because <laughs> a good fall lover. Go, well, girls have already given up on their year. But you, like, you, nah, hang, you hang around Makuga so much. Do you ever get some of the crumbs from the table? Oh, I mean, the, come uh, on now. The residual bass player <laughs> pussy that the, that the lead singer couldn't handle. You get um, rhythm section sex. Yeah, McCook that... and I, we, we've we've had some some fun times, some at, adventures at uh, at pubs, um, at taverns around town, <laughs> but uh, local watering holes. Yeah, nothing really. What more? More often than not, I just I, I get a random text like a week later, and it says, "Why'd you get my number if you weren't going to call me?" <laughs> it's that kind of shit, and I'm like, "Sorry." 
I, uh, that's that that was before I knew you and I was getting pulled into the Schmell's world. That was kind of my impression was like, oh, yeah, yeah I get that. Yeah, girls ask me all the time. What, what's about Mark? What then? He doesn't he doesn't take any opportunities, doesn't take any opportunities. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've seen that. I, I, I've seen the opposite of that. In fact, I've seen you take some swings. But um, what was that? Two thousand six Harloff telling you? That was two thousand six Harloff. <laughs> yeah, that was doesn't yeah. take opportunities. Uh, but it was in two thousand twelve yeah. when the whole gallery is following <laughs> Tiger Woods. There's not a lot left for Scott for Plank up here, just trying to make a paycheck. I, I was always the guy who would do the set, even if I had a good set. And there were some nights that I had great sets, to be honest with you. And I'd you come, were very funny on stage, oh, thank and you. we would, and I and I tell Harold the same thing. So we would, the community would welcome you back uh, with open arms. One day, one day, I need a guy with me to get laid less than I do. Can I can't? <laughs> I would come off stage, <laughs> and I would be sitting around the bar like, "Hey, hey, what are the spoils of my victory?" Yeah. And I'd get, "Hey, where did Lou go?" <laughs> Hey, can you tell me about your friend Christian? <laughs> like even on stage, even after I kill, I'm the best friend. Yeah, yeah. You're just you're the permanent sidekick, and it starts to burr into your psyche. I think a lot of us are side. I think a lot of comics are sidekicks. Like Steve yeah. Simone, it just it, it has he has an, he is maybe the funniest comic I've ever seen. Oh yeah, and he's the guy who just has it in his head that he's a sidekick, and I think a lot of us are like that. That mm-hmm. might be why we like being on stage so much. Yeah. Is for once, it's not the good looking guy that with the jaw yeah. like Tom Brady. Right. A, no, now it's our turn to yeah. get laughs. It's like the best man at the wedding. The most fun we have at a wedding is when we get to give that speech and knock it out of the park. Right. Unlike a wedding, a stand-up comedy crowd is a very different audience because yeah. weddings always have singles tables, right? Yes. Stand-up, you, you're on stage, and let's say the hall, let's say it's a 600-seater, and you have 300 women that are smiling at you and laughing, and they're hysterical because you're, you're making them so happy, and then you get off stage after the show, and you get to meet all their boyfriends. <laughs> It's just not a single woman kind of sport. It's it's, it's bachelorette parties. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not going to go no. home with a with anybody involved with a bachelorette party. You're not going home with Mark Ellis because I don't want to wake up the next day and have you accuse me of shit that I didn't do. I'm not the guy that's going to take advantage of a drunk chick. I'm the guy that's like, I'll sleep outside. Yeah. Okay, I'll go sleep in the lobby. You have the bed and just you know make it before you leave. That that's your heart. That's your yeah. sincere heart, man. You you you've clearly had a good upbringing that mm-hmm. brought you to that point. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but I don't know what happened to Makuga. Um, <laughs> he had success with women early yeah, on. That's early the, on, yeah, yeah, that's a good looking. That's a good looking charismatic cat, man. Yeah, Makuga. You can always tell the guys that are going to do well. They're the first guys in gym class to get chest hair. And everybody's like, oh, hey, somebody's hitting puberty and doing pull-ups better than the rest of us. I think he had a 5 o'clock shadow in the fourth grade. <laughs> I'm pretty convinced Makuga of that. Really, like, I'm not, I'm not a, I never shaved that close to yeah. the skin, but Makuga has the Hanna-Barbera 5 o'clock <laughs> he does. Fred Flintstone thing. He does. <laughs> he has the uh, film noir detective 5 yeah. o'clock shadow. He's got the one that never goes away. Or I have grown my Sir Davos Seaworth Game of Thrones <laughs> beard right now as we got going on. Um, Maybe that's why we're single, Ken, is <laughs> We're up podcasting, <laughs> referencing Game of Thrones yeah. and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And Ron LaFure. Um, so uh, where where uh, where do you want to take Schmoes in the next few years? Let the, let the Schmoville fans who are listening, where do you see it? Um, I, I see it on the same at the same core of mm-hmm. what we're doing now. Not necessarily having the core live on YouTube, mm-hmm. but having the core of what we do just being normal guys talking about movies. Because yeah. that's, that's, that's in us now. It's it, yeah. we're, Once you get to where we are in life, you're not going to suddenly change and become a snooty asshole critic. It's just right. not going to happen. Right. I'm always going to be the guy that's in a movie theater, and when somebody ignites a lightsaber, I'm going to go, yeah. look at that. Right. Um, I, had a, I, had a, I had a mile wide smile on my face when I was watching Pacific Rim, because mm. it's robots fighting monsters. Right. But the good side of this is that I also get to see all those movies that I never would, like Mud, or like the way, way back, where those are kind of the ones that I sneakily look forward to. Right. Because it's not the big blockbuster. Right. So I think the breadth has expanded of what I can watch and appreciate, but that love for that initial blockbuster kind of thing yeah. has never left. And, and the Schmo brand is a very all-inclusive brand. It, it's not a, a niche geek marketed brand. It's not just one side. It, it, it's it's normal people. It, it is, and it's and it's so many different things. Now, when we started, it was, I mean, it, we, we were debating. It's like, what do we call it? Do we call it this? Do we call it that? Do we call it the Harloff and Ellis show? Right. Because that's all it was. It was just two right. schmucks. Talk right. about movies. And now it's you have the YouTube show. We have all these different segments on that. We have our website. Yeah. We have the podcast. Hopefully it's a it's a television mm-hmm. program and, and it's hopefully it's multiple television yeah. programs. And Empire. I mean I look at all of that and you say, Well, when is it when you do Conan? Is it when you do Letterman or with Schmoes? Is it when you get a TV show? When is it that you mm. will kick back and say you're successful? Yeah. And it's like that's not I look at it 
in a different way where I look at life like a pickup basketball game where okay. the only goal when you're playing pickup ball is stay on the court. That's right. the only goal is just to keep playing. Mm. And that's all I'm trying to do. I feel Keep successful playing. now because I'm I'm in the game. Yeah, and Schmoes has taken such a such a turn for the for the cool in the sense mm-hmm. that it's like it, it like was you two in a flip cam yeah. talking about movies. Now it is a, a growing empire that has you know freaking board meetings for God's sakes. You know we have board meetings. We have board meetings. We uh, don't dress. I mean, you dress up. I dress. Nobody up. else dresses yeah. up. Um, but uh, um, I so, think it's I think it's, I like I like what the, what the what it does for the fan base too. What the fan base does for mm-hmm. us as far as schmoes go, because mm-hmm. I mean the comments aren't all one hundred percent great like they used to be. Right, right. People like attacking, and, and that's something that me that I have to remember too is that a lot of people just want to they're coming to it from a movie fan base, mm-hmm. and they don't know that the guy on the right is a comic. They right. just they they see and he's like wow they, they, he just called that chick a whore. Why would he do that? <laughs> And they they don't always get that, so it's a, it's always a nightly test for me too. Right. But I think it's it empowers a lot of our fans who were that age when we were when we were discovering, mm-hmm. oh hey, making girls laugh is fun. Right. Or, or doing this, maybe I could be that. And not everybody out there can is going to have the the capability or the the luck that I have. And I think that being part of a community like Schmoes, I think helps a lot of people feel like they're included in something. And yeah. they are. It's a, it's a real thing out there. We've created a community, or you guys mm-hmm. have created a community and let the rest of us kind of join in to uh, to build up the, uh, the the structure a little bit more. And it's uh, been an interesting ride. And it's, and it's certainly, it, who knows where it can go. We we hope it ends up with uh, where we're inviting Maria Menounos to our parties. Absolutely. And, yeah. and having her get drunk dance uh, uh, fun with Makuga. <laughs> yeah, um, and the nights end a little bit better for Mark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, Schmoville is Grover's Corners, though it really is. Yeah. And you're the who's the guy at the beginning of of our town? It's like the uh, the guy it, he just walks out and mm. he addresses the audience. It's one of oh, those things about like Garrison Keeler. What do you do? do, do? The, the announcer, whoever he is yeah. at the beginning of our town, because yeah. the curtain's still closed. But the guy in our town, he just walks Keeler, out yeah. and he does that yeah. thing. He's like, "Oh, didn't see oh, you there." Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let, let me tell you a story. It's like you didn't really, you didn't know you were walking into a room of very, full of people. Very, and you just had this great story prepared just theater, in case. Theater, man. Oh, I love theater. it. Is it true that you uh, did you did not? Here's your chance to clear the air. Is it true that you did not approve of the name Shamos now? Oh, I, yeah, I was not a fan of it. Yeah, at the beginning, yeah. What did, what did you have? Revenge of the Sith or something like that? I, I, no, I didn't know what it was. Yeah. I kind of liked Harloff and Ellis show mm-hmm. or the Mark Ellis Variety Hour, time permitting Christian Harloff. <laughs> but I. Uh, I, I I've come to embrace Mo's no for what it is because I, yeah. I certainly get the name and I think it's a sure. perfect name. But the problem that I have now with it mm-hmm. is that again going back to stand up when people introduce you, you want to get whatever you're on. You want to get that brand out there. Yeah. So and you want to get current credits. You don't want to use all the crap that you did on TV five years ago. Yeah. You want it to be Schmoes no. And there's very few people who haven't heard of that who yeah. can get it out. Really? Who like MCs and and people who are introducing you? It's a, he's on this internet show. Yeah. Movie thing youtube joe schmoes joe schmoes show schmoes knows yeah, yeah. I, I feel like a diva sometimes when i'm in the green room and i make the guy say it back to me i'm like no because you're gonna try i've seen this happen to every any any mc who's not named fraser smith he's yeah. not gonna get this right he's the only one that can do it so you need to these tell are the me. jokes folks yeah um yeah absolutely but the um, uh, yeah the operation is uh, the operation is good right now. It's good, and, and I've looked the at the future it, is bright. It, it's it's kind of like Ocean's Eleven or like we're I feel like we're Robin Banks. I honestly do. Because, really, What's because that? it's we're having way too much fun for this to be yeah. a real job. And if it's not a real job and you're making money, you're stealing it. And right. if it's a bank robbery operation, then Christian is the Christian's the guy who comes in and he's like, hey. There's there's a bank on Third Street. Okay, here's the blueprints. Here's what we got to do, and then and then I'll be the driver. Yeah, and I'll and I'll I'll park the van and we'll run in there. And sometimes Christian goes for the vault and I hold the gun to the to the townsfolk. <laughs> and sometimes we reverse it. If, but if, um, if he's Danny Ocean and you're Brad Pitt's character, McCook is probably uh, uh, Matt Damon. I'm the uh, sweaty guy with the <laughs> in the van with the glasses. Like uh, just I, I I hacked into the computer system. <laughs> And then oh, that's uh, great. Josh, the intern is those, uh, uh, is Scott Kahn and Casey Affleck rolled into one. Yeah, right? yeah. Or maybe that's him and Shoesy. That's um, right. We should. Somebody needs to do a post. Has anybody done a fan poster of us uh, of as us, Ocean's as Eleven? Ocean's Eleven. I, I, yeah, maybe. Well, it's not going to no. make Christian's wife happy because then Tiffany Smith is going to be Julia Roberts, <laughs> and Christian's real wife looks a lot like Julia Roberts. True. So there's going to be yeah. There's going to be some issues. Going to be some issues. Well, I uh, I did make you cry in this episode because <laughs> um, we didn't want to talk about uh, the Redskins in the mid '90s, but. 
but uh, Ooh, yeah, yeah, that can get you cry yeah. crying. That's All a right. nice Dolphins mug you got. There. Yeah, thank you. Like You've my... been to my apartment. You've seen the poster of John Riggins breaking that tackle, oh, running all man. over Don Shula's Dolphins. Oh, uh, that was a yeah. That was right before I became a big fan. I'm still young, but uh, I do oh, remember. Really? The lo- I do remember the loss. I became a Dolphin fan in '84. Uh, uh, when they went to Super Bowl against the Niners, yeah, and everyone I grew up about three hours north, so everyone was Forty Nine er fans, and mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going for the Dolphins. Oh, I chose wrong. <laughs> it's been twenty five years, yeah, twenty five years of pain and suffering, and now new neon uniforms. Oh, uh, neon! Oh gosh, and, and our tight ends hurt. <laughs> uh, that's a sports talk show. We'll do that some other time. Yeah, that um, one's going to go on for longer. Anything left unsaid that you'd like to get off your chest here? You know, you've I've had Harloff, Riley, McCoog into the studio and and your names come up many times now's your chance here oh just to uh <laughs> to, and now i'd like the airing of grievances and these are personal transgressions that have occurred against me number one christian no it's uh it, it's just been a blast uh making the community bigger too to mm-hmm. have all you guys yeah and uh and again for you personally what you've done for the podcast mm. has been fantastic the, the sport code adds an arrow of legitimacy <laughs> And the news is, like, I look forward to hearing the news, whether I'm uh-huh. in the studio or not. And yeah. I'm usually the loudest one laughing at the jokes. I only do the news for you. I, and 60% of my laughs are genuine, Ken. 60%. <laughs> I'll take it. And it's, it's an easy D. I'll take it. Just look, you know, uh, you don't step on my punchlines, man. <laughs> uh, uh, that's my moment. That's my three minutes to shine. That's right. the only three minutes I enjoy myself yeah. you in know, life. But it's not out of the realm of possibility <laughs> to, to one day do a Schmo's traveling stand-up show Get, oh, yeah. get Christian back in the Rocky gym. Get yeah. Kenny back in the hosting seat. Yeah. Have Makuga pop in. Absolutely. Josh, the intern, can make sure my baby carrots are backstage. <laughs> Riley can be cranking out the jokes. Tiffany yeah. can be the, the card girl in card between. Girl. Yeah. And I love how I just totally made her yeah, a sex object in our <laughs> Ill, ill-conceived scheme. Sorry, when when I have her on the show, I'll let her respond to that, too. That'll be her <laughs> time frame. Uh, well, this has been a very fun episode of the Napsock Files for me, getting to know Mark Ellis and what fuels his comedy and how he got to that point. And there's so much much more to talk to him about but he is a busy man and i've got to let him go because he has three sets tonight <laughs> and then if you want to talk to him 4 a.m he'll be in the pink dot parking lot down the street from the comedy store uh buying some peanut butter and white bread no i can park here for free I, i'm a comic <laughs> look at the sweat this is this is performance sweat it's that same guy heavy set hispanic guy with the buddha belly still there asking for 10 bucks that's when oh. i started that's what Mm-hmm. I'll give it to you for 10. It is 10. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll give it to you for 10. No, I like you. All right. I got a set. I'll be back. I'll be in the belly room. All right. Good luck. Um, all right. So for the na- for uh, this episode of the Napsack Files, um, it is concluding. But we will uh, – you'll be here uh, next week. Um, what am I trying to say? I don't know. I'm trying to wrap up the show. I, there's so much more I want to ask you. I'm kind of sad that I have to uh, let you go. Well, but, I, uh, I appreciate you uh, letting yeah. me on. Let me drone on as long as I can. And I hope there's some people out there who have not fallen asleep yet. No, absolutely not. In fact, you buy, within about 10 seconds, you officially the longest episode of the Napsock Files. Like, this is it, baby. This is the longest one. Well, you one. broke Christian into two, so he's, That's true. his but, competitive nature okay. is not going to let okay. me walk with that That's title, true. but we can we can split the bell. I'll bring you back. Uh, the, you can find the Napsock Files on Facebook. We have a Facebook page. Also, uh, we are on iTunes, and please go there, subscribe, rate, and review. That is how you make it shake in iTunes land. We're also on Stitcher every Thursday. Encore presentations of the Napsock Files can be found on the ToadHopNetwork.com website. Following the Schmoes No Podcast, we broadcast every Thursday, 8 to 10 p.m. And the Napsock Files uh, Encore presentations follow that. So uh, we uh, look for us there on the Toad Hop Network with the Schmoes No Podcast. Find us on Twitter, K-O-Z-P-A-N is me. And don't forget, Ellis has his own. You can follow at Schmoes No, but you can also follow Mark at Ellis5150, which is a reference to Neil Diamond. You son of a bitch. <laughs> We went on for over an hour, and the words Van and Halen never <laughs> left my How You are some kind of sorcerer with this uh, podcast. Part two, buddy. Part Panama. two. We'll talk about it. So for Mark Ellis, I'm Cat Knapsack. We will see you next time on the Knapsack Files.